Hello and welcome to this video on one of the most effective attempts to curb invasive animal species. Australia, like many other countries that were colonised by European powers, has a rabbit population. These were spread by the upper echelons of society, who hunted the rabbits. Prior to World War I, they were relatively kept in check by warreners. They were specialists in breeding and controlling rabbits. This meant rabbits were kept at a low-level population in very narrow geographical regions. That's because they are an introduced species. While the population spread very quickly in some areas due to escapees and so on, but the rabbits proved to be a reliable food source and were kept at least largely, if not entirely, in check. World War I changed this. Australia, like many other countries, sent hundreds and thousands of men to fight in the war. Many of these did not return. In fact, of the about 5 million Australians at the time, 416,000 men, or 39% of the adult, working age Australian male population, went to fight. 215,000 died or were permanently injured from the war. That is more than half of the Australian soldiers. By contrast to this, Germany lost 46% of its adult male working age population by the end of World War II. Germany at the time was a much more industrialised and developed country than Australia, which was still very much an agrarian society. This had an impact on everything and everywhere. Warreners were one of the industries affected. The lack of expertise and people led to rabbit populations escaping and any sense of control going away. They spread and became an invasive species. By 1937, they were in plague proportions. By 1940, there were over 600 million rabbits in Australia by some estimates. They were destroying crops, out-competing grazing livestock, consuming already sparse and precious water, costing money, and to an extent, causing the deaths of Australians through starvation. Unlike the Emu War, this was not something that a few soldiers with machine guns had a chance of winning. There were too many rabbits over too wide an area. Australia needed a solution. Brute force was not going to be it. The answer to this was biological warfare. The idea was to release a virus known to kill rabbits. It was first observed by a Brazilian biologist named Arago. They thought that if you released the virus, it could spread like a plague amongst humans, but only affect rabbits. This would spread quickly and kill off large amounts of the rabbit population very effectively. Myxomatosis virus is from a larger genus. Like other members of its viral family, it has a very large genome, with a lot of DNA that, unusually, is double-stranded. The replication occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell, and it has a natural host. This can be found in South and Central America, but also in brush rabbits in North America. If you could, at least in theory, introduce this to rabbits in Australia, it should spread the same way, and if you do it in the right way, you should be able to get rid of them very quickly. The benefits were obvious, it was a low effort to achieve high results. The problem was how to make it work, and more importantly, would this work? By 1926, the proposal was in place and testing started. The first laboratory tests were not encouraging. As already noted, the rabbits kept growing after this date, and the population was ballooning. The testing results showed that you could kill off a group of rabbits, but they all had to be exposed artificially. This meant that it had a low efficacy, and the method had to be completely overhauled. This led to 1934, and further laboratory testing, both in England and Australia. This is because the problem could not be solved, and it was continuing to have huge impacts. The first thing established was safety. It could not be transmitted to domestic livestock or native animals. This lack of transmission meant it could be very specific and very effective. 
This inevitably led to field trials. Unfortunately, these were disappointing, but they did demonstrate proof of concept. If you could find a way to make it work, it would do a great job. The rabbit worms that were infected with Moxie would die off, but the problem was it did not spread between those warrens. The project was put on hold between 1939 and 1945 for some rather obvious reasons. This included a very bad Charlie Chaplin impersonator, and the reason why we have anime today. By 1949, there were renewed calls for some sort of response from the government, and they needed a solution. With more loss of Australians to war and farmers struggling due to rabbits, there was a mounting problem. This was exacerbated by government policy which provided for soldier plots and farms. These were given to farmers, who were formerly soldiers, on the premise they turned them into farms, and, given that many of them were ex-servicemen, this was a huge liability of a common interest initially, a common problem, and mounting unrest at the fact that nothing was being done about rabbits that were destroying their farms and livelihood. By May of 1950, the government finally decided to start testing this in the field again. They released the virus into a number of warrens. The initial results weren't that impressive. There were 77 rabbits found dead within a relatively short period, but that was out of a population of 4,000. By the end of July, they could not find a single sick rabbit. To further validate this, other warrens were infected with the same virus, and by the end of July, not a single sick rabbit could be found. It seems that the virus had died out and this great plan had failed. By January of 1951, things had changed. What had been a seemingly dead-end plan had turned into a flood of dead rabbits. The virus had a 99.8% fatality rate, and this incredibly high lethality could not be underestimated. This was responsible for many dead rabbits at the time. Why was it now working? where previously it had failed and shown that it could not be spread effectively. The reason for this was interesting and surprising. The spread was found to be caused by heavy rains in the early 1950s that led to a huge buildup of the mosquito population. This mosquito population provided the vector for the virus to be spread between warrens. This is distinct from past studies, which were done in very dry and arid areas, places where there was not a significant mosquito population or other vector that could be used. This brings us to the 1953 period or thereabout. Production of meat and wool had increased by $68 million just from starting to eradicate these rabbits. That's because pastures were recovering from the rabbits eating all of the grass. The native wildlife could start coming back because the food they needed wasn't being outcompeted by the rabbits. Native flora that was going to be consumed by the rabbits was no longer consumed and could grow back. This was a very good sign. However, all good things must come to an end, and by 1995, it was clear that the rabbits were mostly immune to this particular version of the virus. They had multiplied to an estimated 300 million rabbits. That is still half the population of the high point as was estimated in 1940. So you can see that there wasn't the same kind of recovery as there was beforehand. There was, as with all such things, a certain amount of a panic generated. Most of it was caused by ignorant Luddites who insisted that such things weren't possible. It was also coincidentally at the same time as human encephalitis epidemic began spreading across the country. People put these two distinct and unrelated events together and suddenly thought they'd found a relationship. As is want for Australian researchers, they decided to resolve the public anxiety in this 
by injecting themselves with the virus. Why Australian researchers have this bizarre habit of taking something that is experimental and sticking it in their body is beyond us, but it happens. Three of the top researchers in Australia, one being Professor Frank Fenner of the Australian National University, Dr. McFarlane Burnett of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute for Medical Research, and the government's research organisation, CSIRO, chairman, Dr. Ian Clutonese Ross, injected themselves with doses of the virus and demonstrated that it could cause no harm. This helped significantly in resolving the issues of people's paranoia and stupidity. Moxie was later replaced by a new virus called the Kelsivirus. This virus was in turn released unintentionally by insect vectors. This is what allowed for its escape from a quarantine island to the mainland, where it had the intended effect. And it was despite that unintentional release that it was highly effective and proven to be as safe as Moxie. The benefits of the original virus cannot be underestimated. In just two years, the improvement to the agricultural industry was in the millions of dollars. Native flora and fauna were able to begin recovering and regrowing. Farmers were able to start making a living again. In the roughly 70 years since that impact has only been compounded by the benefits. It has, however, had to be revisited and revised in order to deal with the fact that most living organisms in terms of something like a rabbit or other mammal have an adaptive immune system and will eventually get used to the virus. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions you have below.